What we're gonna talk about today is we're gonna go through a scenario of an EMS call, one of our critical EMS calls that we sometimes run into. And a lot of times we get questions on, I called for an ambulance, why did you send a fire engine with that ambulance as well? So we're gonna answer that question and we're gonna do that through this scenario. We're gonna start out with a gentleman who calls for having chest pain. And we're gonna show you what this chest pain could turn into and why we send the amount of people that we send on that call. What you're gonna get uh, five or six personnel, depending on our staffing for the day. Generally, it's gonna be five personnel, three on a fire engine, and then two on ambulance. So for the purpose of this scenario, I'm gonna simulate uh, being in charge of the ambulance, and then the rest of the crew, that are my four partners here are gonna come in and they're gonna operate this scenario. I'm gonna discuss what they're doing, and we're gonna highlight some of the equipment along the way so that you get some answers as to what some of this equipment is that we're requesting to purchase or why we wanna get some of these equipments. We're gonna show you the benefit that those provide us uh, so we can provide an excellent service to the citizens. So we're gonna start out with a scenario. This gentleman here is called for chest pain. So we all approach the scene and we're gonna bring in, come on in, and we're gonna start working on him. So the first thing we're gonna do is we're gonna start asking him questions and we're gonna try and find out uh, when this chest pain started and what caused it, what kind of medical history he has. The benefit we get now with having all five of us on scene is while I'm asking questions, getting history, taking down his information, you see everyone else is already starting to work. So we're doing things like taking his vital signs, getting his blood pressure, getting his heart rate, checking his oxygen levels. We could put him on oxygen if need be. We're gonna hook him up on a cardiac monitor. If you wanna take a peek in over here, we could take a look at their rhythm. We'll talk a little bit about the cardiac monitor itself. What it does for us is we can hook him up to this machine. This is a very expensive uh, piece of machine, somewhere around 35 to $40,000. But what it does for us is a multitude of things. Right now you're seeing, we can see what their heart rhythm is right here. So our paramedics are trained to read and decipher what that rhythm is. It gives us the rate right here if this was a real person, their oxygen saturation would come up right here. The other thing we can do, which they're obtaining right now, is we can get the 12 lead EKG. This is the same EKG that you would get in the hospital, at your doctor's office, and it's gonna print out. Our paramedics are trained to read these 12 lead EKGs, and we can make the determination if you're having a heart attack in the field. If we get one that maybe isn't obvious that we can't decipher, we also have the ability to transmit these 12 leads. We can send this to the ER doctor at the hospital. This goes to the ER doc, this goes to the cardiologist on call, and through to the cath lab. So if the patient is having a heart attack, as is the case in this scenario, we transmit that, now the hospital's ready. We can shorten what they call the door to balloon time, which is you know, the best advocacy for the patient, is getting them that care. We get them to the right facility, get them to the right place as quick as we can. <clears throat> a couple other things we can do with that. If your heart rate is too slow, we can actually deliver electricity through it and we can make your heart beat faster. If your heart is beating too fast, we can deliver electricity that restarts the heart, slows it down. If you go into cardiac arrest, it also works as a defibrillator. So if you go to public places, you see automated external defibrillators, this operates in that same capacity. We can just use it in manual function. So if we come back and look at our monitor again, we'll notice that there has been a rhythm change. This rhythm is what we would call ventricular fibrillation. For us, that tells us that this patient is now in cardiac arrest. So you can see they're initially gonna start doing compressions. We'll throw a CPR plug in here. Please take a CPR class. Doing chest compressions is the most important thing you can do for a patient if they go into cardiac arrest. You'll see the device that they're putting on on their chest here. This is called the Lucas 3. It's an automated chest compression device. We have three of these in the Xenia Fire Division. We keep two of them on the frontline ambulances and the third one's on the shift commander vehicle. And these will do chest compressions for us. As you can see, they're doing the chest compressions throughout putting the device on. That's something that we frequently train on. And then they get the device set. They'll turn it on. They'll slide the piston down to the chest, which sets the depth and then they'll hit the start button and it's gonna deliver two inches CPR, 120 compressions a minute, which is the ideal compression ratio according to the American Heart Association. The benefit that this gives us is it frees up one of our personnel, really two of our personnel. In the past, if we're doing manual compressions, you get about two minutes of CPR before you need to rotate out because you get tired. The machine doesn't tire. We carry two batteries, we also have a converter that we could plug it into the wall if we had to run a prolonged scenario. 
it's gonna do those good compressions. No matter what, we can move the patient. There's a backboard underneath that provides the stability. We can use that to help move if we wanna go from the ground or wherever we're at into the ambulance. It also provides some safety as we're driving to the hospital. If the patient is continuing to be in cardiac arrest or they're going in and out of cardiac arrest, we can start and stop this machine uh, with the simple push of a button. If we're doing manual compressions and we're driving down the road, that puts our paramedics in an unsafe position of having to be standing up, bent over, as the crew is driving lights and sirens to the hospital. Now with the Lucas device, our folks can sit back and be more restrained while the device is doing the compressions for us. Okay, you'll notice Brandon over here, he just put simulated putting this device in. So this would be simulated that we're going into the bone. So this takes place uh, in the place of an IV. We generally put IVs in so we can deliver medication. In a cardiac arrest scenario, the veins may be depleted because the heart hasn't been sending any blood. So we can actually take this needle and we can deliver it into the bone. We can go into the shoulder in a cardiac arrest scenario, and then we can deliver this medication uh, through this IO into the bone, and it goes right into the vessels to the heart. The next thing they're doing is they're working on intubation, intubating the patient. So they're assisting the ventilations with the bag valve mass device, and then they've put the tube down in the throat. The device they used for that was the King Vision. The King Vision is a video laryngoscopy device that allows us to see through a camera. So the old direct laryngoscopy was a metal handle and a metal blade, and we would put our paramedics would have to get their face down close. They would have to look down into the airway it put them in a pretty close spot if the patient had any uh, secretions come up or any vomit or anything like that, our faces were real close to theirs. Using this screen gets us out away and then it also provides a light down closer, which gives us a better view. We can also use this device to continue to check and make sure that the tube stays in place. Anytime we move the patient, patient we like to check uh, the placement of the tube to make sure that it didn't become dislodged during that movement. So we can put this back in and check to make sure that it has stayed in the correct spot. Next thing they're doing here throughout the scenario, as you see, the compressions have not stopped. We would have one paramedic would be watching the monitor. So we'll watch certain things with their capnography levels. If we would see a sharp increase in that, that would uh, could possibly mean that the patient has regained circulation and we would stop compressions and then we would make the transport to the hospital. So one paramedic will kind of stand back and watch that. If we're also giving defibrillations, as in the case in this scenario, um, they're giving those every uh, two to three minutes, we're doing defibrillations as well, which delivers a shock through to the heart to try and restart it. We're gonna to continue to assist their ventilations because at this point they're not breathing on our own. So we're gonna give a breath once every five to six seconds. And then, through that IO needle that we put in their shoulder, we're delivering medications. And we will go through a, a host of different medications that are used to attempt to start the heart back up. The other paramedics on scene at this point, what they would be doing is trying to find a way to get out of the house. So we don't know when these calls come in, are we gonna be on the first floor, second floor, are we in an apartment complex that could be you know, three, four, five stories up? Are we in a basement? Um, are we working in a car? We don't know where these are gonna be until we're dispatched there. So they're gonna be working on a way to get these patients out. So we always work with the uh, concept that the patient's gonna regain circulation and we're gonna transport them to the hospital. So we're gonna have a plan to get them out. So they're working on that right now as well. We take a look at the monitor, we see another rhythm change. So now we have a heart rate back. So we're now gonna load this patient up for transport to the hospital. So we would use that, we would be in place for that already. We have a couple different devices we could use to get them down and out of the house. Once we got them into Amos, then we would transport to the hospital. We'll still send a couple of paramedics with us because they may go back into cardiac arrest. So we will take one to two additional paramedics with us to the hospital 
Uh, we'll keep the Lucas device on in case we go back into cardiac arrest. We can simply hit play and that starts doing good compressions again. We keep them on the monitor throughout. This is a time we would be on the phone with the hospital. We would be transmitting uh, what we had beforehand. In this scenario here where the patient had a heart attack, we would be going to an interventional facility so we could update them on what happened. We could continue to transmit the different EKGs. Um, the last thing we didn't really show or couldn't see here is just the other medications that could be given uh, ahead of time. A chest pain patient may have gotten some certain medications, some oxygen, aspirin, nitroglycerin. So those are all things we're doing consecutively through the assessment process. Um, we hope that kind of answers some of the questions that you uh, may have had about some of the equipment that we have and why we send some of the personnel we do. We can touch on that a little bit. That's all done off of dispatch codes. So the dispatchers will ask uh, a select number of questions when someone calls 911, and then they put that into their computer system, and then that will bring up a suggestion for them based off a system that um, our folks have designed that says send this equipment to these call types. So certain call types will send both the fire engine and the ambulance right away. Um, other times if the ambulance gets there first and they need some help, then they can always call for the fire engine later as well. Um, if you have any subsequent questions on any equipment, if you would like to come up and see anything we've done, feel free to stop by Fire Station 1, 225 East Main Street at any time and we'd be glad to show you what we have. Thanks for watching.